Alistair Appleby, who is a GP in Ivymore, and he's uh, set up um, managing pain skills, uh, which is a really good approach to looking at chronic pain in uh, primary care. And his uh, talk today is it's good to talk. On you go, Alistair. Thanks very much. Thanks very much to you, Stephen. Thanks for everybody for attending. So yeah, this is very much about how to talk to patients uh, in primary care, uh, patients who have chronic pain. So without further ado, we'll look in the session about how to identify patients with chronic primary pain, and I'll explain what that means. Uh, we'll look at time resources and some challenges and solutions, because that uh, is a key issue for general practitioners. We'll look at how to prepare ourselves to speak with these difficult, demanding and potentially rewarding patients. And we look at how to create a framework uh, or model from which we can, patients and ourselves can talk about and understand chronic pain. How long have you got, Doc? Well, how long does it take to unpack a problem like chronic pain? Feels like quite a long time. But maybe compare this with the time for a prescription or, or specialist referral, just a few minutes. So the referral is looking quite attractive or the prescription. But then think about the time that chronic patients take with duty doctor calls in distress, with complex decisions and discussions about opiates and with high levels of consulting. In Aviemore, we looked at patients with chronic pain, found that they consult about 15 times a year. That's about four hours of your time this year, and that'll be four hours next year, and that'll be four hours the year after, and that will keep going. Imagine if your plumber limited his visits to 15 minutes, what would happen to your heating system? In other words, if we decide to do everything in 15 minutes, we may find that things start to break down and the sort of interventions that chronic pain patients need don't happen. So then they come back, they come back to duty doc and we get that frustrating phone call again uh, for a patient we don't really know asking us to jack up their OPS. Sound familiar? Um, so I'm going to encourage you to think about strategic investments of time. Um, so in a series of patients um, with chronic pain in Aviemore, uh, we looked at a structured program uh, involving an hour of general practitioner time over several weeks, uh, uh, and that resulted in a 30% reduction in the number of consultations per year. If you do the maths on that, that means you are paid back for that time in six months, and then uh, after that, because we think that reduction in consulting is maintained, you're then winning. So consider making a strategic investment of time in these patients to try and get a good treatment plan and to try and get a good understanding, to try and help them to understand their chronic pain and to, to increase their skills in, in managing their own pain. Uh, we all make strategic investments of time. For example, it might take a few hours to go and collect a washing machine, but that will save us hours in the coming weeks and months not having to wash clothes. Why can't we do the same at work? Perhaps that requires some negotiation with your colleagues, or perhaps you just need to make that patient the last patient of the day. Second thing is, uh, is when to communicate. We tend to communicate with these patients when they're in distress. So when they're in distress, they phone uh, and they're put onto a duty doctor screen. And then we have a very difficult conversation with them when they're, they're triggered, uh, they're emotional, they're activated or anxious, or what I sometimes call hot. It's very difficult to make progress with patients or negotiate things with them when they're in that very activated and anxious state. They're often not thinking that rationally and you often end up feeling cornered feeling cross and not making much progress. So dialogue with these patients when they're at their calmest and coolest, uh, make booked appointments with uh, the doctor who knows them best and with whom they have some continuity. It's very easy to deal with these patients 
uh, as a duty doc call and think, thank goodness, I'm not going to see that patient again. But you won't really have achieved much psychological progress with that patient during that hot duty call. So get them when they're cool so you can do some useful work with them. So just to summarize uh, uh, when to talk, reduce or stop duty doctor calls about analgesia and do some brief holding work. So if you're a duty doc and you get a call, you might want to, you want to validate the distress. I can hear you're distressed. I really want to help you move on with this. You want to do some holding work and you want to make a future appointment when they're cool. I can give you an appointment in 10, in 10 days time when I really have time to do this justice and set things on the right path. In the meantime, would it be okay to? And then you might mention something you think is appropriate for this patient. Gentle stretching, hot baths, practicing relaxation using existing pain relief. And then, you, of course, you have to follow up with that protected longer appointment, preferably with a, a consistent GP. So the, the next thing is to prepare ourselves to find the right headspace for dealing with these patients because they can be incredibly frustrating, can also be very, very rewarding. Um, so they're often frustrating because they've been unreasonable or demanding, and that's partly because our system, the 15 minute system, um, doesn't really work, work well for these patients. And also we've created unrealistic expectations over the years by talking about things like painkillers and pretending that we, we've got a cure for everything. The causes of chronic pain, if uh, you look at Fink's work, um, include predisposing factors like genetics and upbringing, include precipitating factors like surgery and infection, include potentiating factors, cultural factors, family factors, and inappropriate treatment. The great majority of these factors are not within patient's control. They are things that have happened to them. So chronic pain is very largely not a patient's fault. We have to find that headspace uh, when we start to deal with them. Just to go back to that, I just need better painkillers, doc. I can't stand this. Acknowledge the, dis the, dis the distress. Explain the possible effects of more, of more opiates, and it's often what's, what that's about. Temporary relief, longer term harm, and loss of effect. Try and keep calm yourself and make sure you, 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 you're clear that this is not the patient's fault. And use the term in your best interest. Uh, that's the magic, magic phrase I teach all of my trainees. It wouldn't be in your best interest to, for example, receive more opiates. It wouldn't be in your best interest to, for example, have another duty doctor call. It wouldn't be in your best interest to, what, uh, you can add your own ending to that. Um, try not to say, I'm not prepared to. Try not to say, um, that's illegal. Try not to uh, take defensive lines. Keep talking about what's really helpful for the patient and then make time to do this justice and explain to the patient what they can do meantime. Next thing is to have realistic expectations. Chronic pain is not curable. You may be able to help the patient understand their condition and learn some skills to deal with it. Acceptance of that by both sides is key to uh, coping and recovery from chronic pain. I spoke to a patient recently uh, who said to me, I really started to move forward only when I realized I would not get rid of this pain. So my experience is, and this is about realistic expectations for yourself, about 30% of patients can be substantially helped by an approach like the MAPS approach. Uh, MAPS, as Steve said, managing pain skills for general practitioners is outlined and fully explained on the Aviemore uh, practice website under the chronic pain tab, and I can probably share, share that link later on. Uh, there's practitioner and patient guides there that take you through how to think about um, principles of education uh, of, um, uh, of CBT and of an appropriate activity plan 
which is the best treatment for chronic primary pain. So my experience using that is about 30% of patients will be substantially helped. My very first patient came to me as basket case. You know, we don't know what to do with this woman, a young woman uh, who was out of work and could never see herself going back to work. It took about eight weeks for her to go back to work, um, but that's that's unusual. Uh, maybe one in 10 patients, you get that sort, sort of success. 30% will be substantially helped, maybe 30 somewhat helped, and 30 to 40 will disengage or not, not report any help. Where are we here? Um, so have I got the right patient? Am I ready to start sort of dealing with this patient in a holistic way that is informed by CBT and creating um, um, helping them to understand chronic pain? So first of all, has your patient got, uh, is, if the patient's got an unclear diagnosis, outstanding scan or consultant opinions, clarify those issues before you start. It's not an either or, you can use um, principles of pain management and say, but we will continue to investigate you. But often it just trips the patient up because they keep thinking, yeah, but what about the scan? And it can also become somewhat embarrassing when you've perhaps given a functional pain explanation and the patient comes back with a scan that shows a kidney tumour. So make sure that you're confident that those are complete. Someone's got to be brave enough to draw a line under investigation and as a general practitioner, that's you. The consultant's not going to do it. Uh, they're, they're not very good at that. Uh, so somebody, and if that needs a discussion with another partner or with the partners, that's very helpful just to say, am, am I missing something? And record that clearly in the notes so you feel that at this point, investigations are complete. Obviously screen for depression uh, and treat that. You can take questions at the end, uh, but we'll just keep going. Uh, chronic primary pain is a, a new diagnosis for an old problem, a problem we've seen for a long time. Uh, this is really helpful diagnosis that um, category that comes into ICD-10. Uh, and it involves um, several things. One is that the pain lasts for more than three to six months. Uh, secondly, it, this is multi-site pain. It's not just in the patient's hip or just in the patient's ankle, it's in several areas. The third is that there's high levels of emotional distress and or social dysfunction. And fourthly, as we've said before, it's not better explained by another diagnosis. So these are patients I used to dread. I used to think, oh, we've got, oh the pain's lasted for that long and oh, it's all over the place. And, Oh, the patient's really messed up by it. I used to think this is terrible, you know, this um, I'm not going to manage this. These are the patients that are helped by chronic pain approaches, holistic approaches like the MAPS approach. So you might even look forward to hearing that type of thing. So let's just do that again with an example. Chronic pain will be a 68 year old woman with osteoarthritis in her hip who can no longer play golf and is waiting for an ortho assessment, a familiar scenario, and is fed up with this, as is her GP. Uh, so we treat that in the usual way with physio, analgesia, injection, joint replacement, and we monitor their mood. Chronic primary pain, an example would be a 47 year old woman with abdominal and pelvic pain, whose CT and scope findings are negative, who's had to give up work as a secretary and who struggles with pain and exhaustion to do housework. Evidence base for that is to treat that with a holistic approach, give information about chronic pain, acceptance of the condition, uncovering and challenging and helpful thinking and behavior and appropriate activity plan and encouraging the patient to live a meaningful life with the condition. Also want to monitor and treat mood and you want to avoid medical harm and that means a prescription of inappropriate medication and inappropriate referral. This is the 
WHO pain pyramid. This is right for trauma and surgical pain, but it's wrong. It's not evidence-based for chronic pain, the type of pain that GPs often see. So the pain pyramid for chronic primary pain would look something more like this. Okay, you can find my next slide. I consider creating a drug-free zone. Uh, I see patients that my uh, partners refer uh, to me and my agreement is I don't touch their drugs. I expect them to have a medication review before they come to me. Uh, but you might want to say something to a patient along these lines. We spent a lot of time trying medication, but most of the science now points to other treatments as most effective. Let's put this aside for today so we can concentrate on some possibly more, more powerful approaches. Or as I sometimes say to patients, I'm going to use a scientific non-medication approach. And get your holism glasses on. If you look at the so causation and the nature of chronic pain, one way of thinking about this is to bring hospice thinking, the thinking you would bring to a palliative case patient, to a patient with chronic pain. So um, Saunders' concept of total pain really works for patients with chronic pain, particularly chronic primary pain. Uh, so the total pain being um, the addition of physical, psychological, social and spiritual factors, there's quite a big um, evidence base now for a relationship between spirituality and, and chronic pain. And then you want to create a model uh, uh, through which on which you can start to understand chronic pain and to talk to the patient about chronic pain. So at medical school, we got this very simplistic linear idea of pain. The pain starts with um, stimulation of peripheral nerves or with tissue damage and the linear message goes to the brain where it's appreciated as pain. However, uh, we know that uh, things are much more complicated than that. There are downward, downward pathways like the GABA pathway. Uh, there's a constant sort of sprinkling of um, calming um, neurotransmitters and downward messages in the, nor in the normal uh, nervous system. And that tends to be switched off in patients with chronic pain. Uh, so patients with chronic pain tend to experience that sort of long-term mild discomfort in the way we would experience an acute pain. Uh, it's important to get this sort of complicated, um, unified and multi-directional uh, model of pain going with patients so that they think of their body and their mind as linked together and part of the whole person. If you can't establish that, you get things like this. So you're saying, this is all in my mind, doc. Uh, so in other words, I've got a mind and I've got a body. Um, uh, so you're saying um, the scans are negative, And therefore, if there's nothing wrong with my body, there must be something wrong with my mind. And patients don't really like that. Um, so I might respond with something along the lines of the body and mind are parts of the same whole. They're connected through an immensely complicated network of nerves and hormones. When things go wrong, it always affects the body and it always affects the mind, a part of the same person. So you might want to think of a phrase that you want to use to talk about um, to talk about them. So you might want to simply use the word whole person. You might want to use the word body mind person. You might want to borrow from existentialist philosophers like Kierkegaard and talk about the self. Uh, <laughs> if you've had a large cup of coffee already that day. Uh, and another way of putting this is that the body and mind are always in constant conversation. They're sending each other messages. The conversation has often gone wrong in patients with chronic pain. 
And that's a really helpful way to talk to patients is that, no, there's nothing wrong with your mind. There may be nothing we can find wrong with your body, but the way they're talking to each other has become disordered. So you want to be uh, introduced the idea of upward causality. We know about that damage to a limb, send signals to the brain. You want to also think about downward causality. Brain processes these impulses and sends back signals to the tissue through the GABA system and through hormonal systems. And you might also want to think about complex causality. So human brain has about the same number of neurons in it as the number of people on the planet, six to 20 billion. Each of those has about a thousand connections. So you're talking about a number of connections in the human brain that exceeds the number of electrons in the universe. That's quite a big system and quite a complicated system. And in complicated systems, unusual things happen. So weather systems, we're all familiar with the sort of butterfly that causes the storm. So strange things happen in complicated systems like the body-mind person. So some simple examples of this you could use with patients is um, a picture of a friend who died recently shown to us uh, can, can cause uh, our glands to secrete this, this stuff called tears and make us cry or shame about a relationship might cause chronic pelvic pain or worry about hurting our back might make us really stiff in the morning or surgery despite a good technical outcome might cause ongoing pain for example in post cholecystectomy syndrome have we got five more minutes steve i'm going to give you three analogies that really work with patients you may want to think of others uh, but uh, I find these really helpful. The first is the gong. Um, so chronic pain is like the sound that persists after a gong has been hit. So the gong has been hit and there's been some trauma or infection or um, a slip disc or something. Um, and the, the tissue damage is now subsided, but the gong is still ringing. Uh, the nervous systems have, have learned and humans are learning systems, have learned this pattern of pain and it rings on after the actual event. Good news is you can help patients to turn up the GABA system and to turn down the, the volume and damp down these ongoing persisting um, experiences of pain. If you're starting to talk about functional pain and probably nearly all chronic primary pain has a functional element. Um, then I find uh, the motorway analogy useful. So on a motorway, there might be a traffic jam. We can start pulling off cars and looking under them, looking at their engines. We can examine the tarmac. We're not going to find anything wrong because it actually is the way the cars are being driven that's the, the problem. So the problem is not the, the, the physical nature of the cars or something wrong with them. And that's why scans and tests are negative. The problem is the way that this is functioning. So you use the word functional in an open and non-judgmental way. Functional doesn't mean imaginary. It doesn't mean all in the brain. It means a problem of function in the same way your TV might malfunction. And the third analogy is sprinkler system so the GABA and other pathways are constantly soothing the nervous system a bit like a sprinkler system damping down a fire this sprinkler system tends to be turned off in patients with chronic pain but the good news is the work that you can do with patients to help them to understand pain to learn some relaxation um, techniques and to learn to pace themselves and take appropriate activity uh, can help to turn back on the GABA system, uh, turn back on the sprinkler. And the final thing I want to mention is to is to listen to what I call the suffering narrative. Uh, so what are patients 
thinking? Uh, how are they processing what's been happening to them? Uh, so questions like, why do you think this pain has happened to you? Uh, what do you think this pain means? What do you tell yourself when things get really bad? That's a really key question. You want to write those down in the notes um, explicitly what the patient says, because those are hints uh, about where the patient is with this. And they're also hints about thinking problems and perhaps problems of perception that you may need to address. Last two slides. So when you meet with a patient with chronic pain, how might the first 10 minutes look like? Let the patient speak for several minutes. Ask when it started. What was happening around that time? Were things happening in the family, in their emotional life? Uh, was there a change of location or employment? Was there a stressful, stressful event? What does the patient think might have triggered or contributed to the pain? Did, were they having surgery? Um, did they have an infection? Show your acceptance and belief in the patient's experience, no matter how odd it might seem. You'll have a chance further down the line to start to introduce these ideas of complex causality and, uh, and functional pain, which helps, to, helps them to understand. And a nurse uh, in her 50s said to me a few couple of years ago, she said, I've been a nurse all my life. Nobody's ever explained to me why I've got this pain. And now I understand. I make an accurate record, including the suffering narrative. How can I get more help? Uh, as I've um, suggested before, there's, um, there's patient and physician guides on the Abima website which take you through the MAPS approach. Those are free to, to print and to use. And if you want additional training about that, particularly for general practice practitioners, you're welcome to talk to me about that in the future, either for yourselves or for your practice. That's it. Thanks very much for listening. I don't know whether it's time for questions, Steve, but I'm just going to hand back to you. Thanks, Alistair. I'm having technical problems at my end. Um, that, that's really great. I think um, I, I was hoping that Laura was going to join us to, to, to um, share her case presentation, but I can't see her on the attendees. Is Laura uh, Cameron there? I don't think so. Uh, so um, I, I'm sure there will be some questions. Uh, I'm just going to um, show you where else you can find the um, uh, the information about that. Um, I'll take your presentation down, Alistair, if that's all right. Yes. And does anybody have any any questions for Alistair? I see Christoph from Nairn. Christoph, you've been then. Um, looking at trying to do something like maps how, how are you getting on what, what are the barriers there so my, my apologies for coming uh, late um i've just learned last week that my my bid for funding um from the uh, modernization patient, uh, patients pathways um scotland has been accepted so um i hope that uh, i'll be able to move on um with, with that um so um by the looks of it, I'll be able to run a six month uh, trial um, and uh, we'll see how it goes. And then hopefully um, I'll be able to make it uh, part of the services available for patients in NERN. Um, and uh, I just had a wonderful meeting with uh, with one of my former patients um, from the time when I was a trainee in in Forest and um, in forest. part of uh, what we were going through was um, was the Australian uh, video understanding pain in five minutes, and um, he what he was able to tell me uh, was simply that uh, this video uh, changed his life. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually extremely moving meeting. Um, so this this is a man, um, um, who's around fifty year old, um, who um, at some point had uh, very serious suicidal. 
um, thoughts and was actually admitted to uh, Ward 4 in, in Elgin Hospital um, straight from the appointment with um, pain specialist in, 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 from, in Aberdeenshire. Um, and he told me that there was a time when he knew all the ambulance crews uh, knew him by first name um, because he was coming to A&E um, on at least monthly monthly basis um, because he found that only um, intravenous morphine was helping him. He was on 10 different medications, including high doses of MST. He, as he put it, uh, was drinking from Oramorph bottle um, in desperation. And um, after working uh, together, um, and actually it was all happening during COVID, so th today is the first time we met in person, um, and we only knew each other from telephone con uh, conversations. So um, he, uh, after I left back in August 2020, he hasn't been to A and E. Uh, for a year and a half, um, he hasn't. Uh, he didn't need to see a GP um, for over a year, and um, from from ten medications that he was on before, including high dose MST, Oramorph, uh, amitriptyline, gabapentin, and so on and so forth, uh, he's now down to twenty milligrams of fluoxetine and uh, lansoprazole. Um, he's running uh, three different companies. Um, he's got new partner and uh, the partner has got um, six kids, so he now has got eight kids and he's delighted with his life. Um, and, you know, that, that's so inspirational um, uh, to meet someone like, like, like him and be able to, to, to share that story with you. And, um, you know, all, all that we did really when, when we were speaking on the phone was that we identified that when he is really busy with his business or he's volunteering work, the, the pain is not so much an issue. Um, as soon as he has got more space um, for the pain in his life, the pain becomes overwhelming. Um, and that, that was the, the kind of the, the, the wedge opening the doors. Um, and with, we, you know, we, we, we started talking about how complex pain is and and how multifactorial and we, we you know we, we just built on built on that and then him watching the video for for him that was a light bulb moment um and as as he put it today it was it was um life-changing so yeah i just wanted to share that with you thanks christoph i think that's uh you know that you've got a few patients across the years who have gone like that and uh, it's really, really encouraging. And uh, um, that was uh, somebody else who had see, seen uh, back in April. And when she came to the review appointment, you know, she'd done all the stuff and her pain was a lot better and she had no bad days. And uh, her, her, uh, her, her thought was, why, you know, why, why did I have to wait eight, 11 years to do this? Um, so uh, really good. I was going to show um, where the uh, uh, info as well on the Highland Pain Info website um, and uh, let's just see if it will come up here. Yeah, that's great. So, so I, um, and in the professionals um, uh, page, uh, we've got the pain learning series. So we've got maps here as well. Well, and there's quite useful stuff in the quality of prescribing for chronic pain um, and then uh, to go into a, a, a lot of a, a lot more depth uh, there's a modular course from faculty of pain medicine and another resource that um, uh, I know Kieran Dinwoody has been finding really useful uh, he's the deputy lead for uh, chronic pain in primary care um, it's just live well with uh, pain uh, and Fantastic information from Australia and the New South Wales uh, uh, ACI network uh, for pa for professionals and for patients. Um, I think one thing that we didn't uh, you, you talked to me about uh, Alistair about um, the uh, when the patient is ready to have information and and uh, and, and Christoph, you were talking about that. You know, there was something that opened the door 
Uh, and, and one area we didn't really talk about is sort of stages of change um, uh, and uh, uh, motivational interview, which is probably a whole presentation or, or a couple of presentations by, by itself. And I wonder whether Lauren might do, do that sometime in, in the future. Um, but uh, you know, so looking at um, the uh, uh, any sort of hint of change talk in uh, in the patient, um, uh, or developing discrepancies, or so I'm taking this medication, but it's not really making any difference to the pain, or um, uh, or looking at uh, those sort of signs that they're going to move from pre-contemplative to contemplating change, and then helping to support them to get into um, action. Um, so I, I guess that's a really uh, useful thing. And the, the other thing I think it may be shared with uh, the um, uh, invite to the session is this flipping pain. Um, uh, and they've got some fantastic patient experiences because uh, a lot of patients, they're sort of stuck in this cycle of chronic pain medication and disability and limitation and uh, and misery and so um we could you know you can tell patients this is what i think is in your best interest and they might think well that's what you would say and so i think it's really useful to have some patient uh feedback so this is six patients in there i wish i knew then what i know now and um the flipping pain airshire is out just uh last month and I got a fantastic bit from a, a guy who was I think a steel worker very skeptical about uh, going to a pain management program and um, uh, you know you're telling me about this sort of visualization well get on your bike uh, and uh, at, at the end of him um, having uh, been able to do the pain management um, uh, he's uh, like your patient back in work and uh, and so on. And I think another um, area which might be really useful for patients and for you in primary care is this navigator tool, which is um, uh, where you've got patients coming for short appointments. And we did some research a few years ago looking at the common problems from the GP and the patient's point of view. Um, and there were uh, there was these um, uh, common concerns from a lot of interviews that we did with uh, GPs and um, with uh, uh, with patient, patient focus groups. So about the diagnosis and cure, how they're feeling um, and uh, changes in their life and medication. And so it can be a way of um, people uh, preparing for their uh, appointment. Um, is that coming up? OK, it is, isn't it? I think I'm never confident with uh, sharing presentations on Teams, but um, that, again, that's on the the, the front page of uh, the Highland Pain Info website. Um, does anybody else have any any comments or uh, questions about uh, Alistair's talk? No. Um, Lauren, were you going to say something? Or are you thinking? No, not going to say anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll be, I'll I, don't be... if I, had, I don't know if you can hear me, Steve. Sorry, I haven't got my microphone working. Oh, right. You can hear sorry. me. Yeah, I can hear you. Who's that calling? It's Liz. Right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, it was really helpful hearing Alice to say about the, the kind of, I don't know, rule of threes or 30%. Go with it. 30 to 40. <laughs> Nearly there. And it's. It's recognising the ones that maybe aren't ready to listen. You know, I, I work as a first contact physio and it's, it's you know, I suppose it's listening out for those words if they're thinking about being ready for change. But yeah, it's, it's helpful to have that, that perspective about maybe being realistic about who you can help or when you can help them. What are my thoughts? I think uh, in uh, Explain Pain, um, which is... Uh, way of explaining pain by David Butler and Laura Mosley is uh, again from Australia. Um, they, um, we can we can have a great urge to get everything over that we know to the patient and it's a good idea to 
ask at the beginning, uh, is it OK if we talk about some of the underlying reasons for pain or if we, we think about uh, other ways of, of looking at it from uh, apart from, from medications, you getting the patient's consent to start off that discussion? Yeah, absolutely. I try and ask patients if they, if they want to talk about it or they want to listen to it, because I, I probably have a habit of giving my opinion and it's trying to, to resist that. Yes, when, when we uh, want your opinion, we'll, we'll give it to you. Yes. <laughs> uh, or the writing reflex, uh, which is uh, the one that you must always avoid, is uh, telling the patient, no, that's wrong, this is right. Um, uh, I was wondering, Tina, would, would you have any, any comments on... Uh, Tina's uh, uh, been helping us with our introduction to pain management. Uh, groups and was a patient uh, with chronic pain before, or uh, is she still a patient? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's one of my bugbears, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just so happy to hear that people are interested in the topic now. I mean, I've been a sufferer for over 30 years, so I've been in the system a long time. Uh, and being believed was one of the big issues that I had and, and down in Manchester when I finally got on the, the pain management course was the first time I heard people say, believe you have pain. Um, from my point of view, accepting it, of course, uh, was my the start of my journey to, to be able to deal with it. But also I think it's very important that patients are educated and help to learn about the complexities of pain that you've all been talking about so that we can understand how we can start to unravel all the different issues for ourselves because we don't we don't know really what's causing the pain all we know is that we're in a lot of pain and until we can understand how the body is working and and how we can help manage it then that that will start us off I think on our journey to be able to to live with it. But one of the things that doesn't come up, I don't think often enough, but has come up earlier was the issue of suicidal thinking. And I know I was at that point and I know so many others get to that point. And, and I wonder how, what help there is out there for that acute situation where you get to the point where you just cannot live with it anymore. I was lucky I was helped, but I know other people obviously complete suicide and, and other people are in that awful place where they're in so much pain that, that they can't deal with it. And I don't know what the services are like in Highland or across Scotland, because I know there are difficulties in mental health teams anyway, let alone specialised care. And again, the other topic that I have a big bugbear about is physio, specialised physio, because that helped me and the nine other people on the course in Manchester all benefited from specialised physio even though we'd had physio before that hadn't seemed to work for us, we were all so much better at the end of the three weeks. So, yeah. Thanks, Tina. Yeah, I think that's, uh, Steve, I can just come back. I think that's absolutely right. Try and get a physio to work with you, a physio who's prepared to get some extra training in, <clears throat> in chronic pain. Um, yeah, that's absolutely, uh, that's absolutely, um, Right, I think that if you can get a physio to partner you, um, you'll make a, a much more sub substantial difference. Yeah. I, th I think from the suicide point of view, um, you know, it's uh, it's a, 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 a difficult area to, to deal with, especially in the uh, current times when we're often on the phone or on videos were not there with the patient and uh, uh, and so I, I think there is actually really good uh, online mental health so there is a breathing space for uh, people to to talk to and obviously Samaritans uh, is really good and there's quite good online uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, so Silver Cloud um, is uh, uh, for uh, and they have a course for uh, anxiety and depression associated with pain or mood uh, asso problems associated with pain, but not really a pain management program. Uh, and uh, um, I think that, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, obviously, if there's uh, in, you, you're wanting to look at the seriousness of the intent and whether there are, um, you know, uh, quite a, if there are risk factors, you know, like previous attempts or, um, you know, access to means or plans that patients have made and whether there are protective uh, factors like that. I wouldn't because I know it would really hurt my family or my kids or, uh, or, or things like that. So um, I think it's, uh, you know, um, we, we don't want to go and uh, I think play around uh, uh, mental health um, when we haven't had all the sort of in-depth uh, uh, psychiatric, psychological training that, uh, that other people might have had. But I think there's some you know, really good resources that are available. Um, and I think people are a bit more, uh, 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 you know, willing to, to reach out for, for help. I think there's been a lot more discussion, uh, especially since over the last year that there's or the last couple of years now of the pandemic that um, there's been so much uh, distress and anxiety in society in general. It's, it's become a lot more uh, acceptable to say, I'm not all right, um, I think now, isn't it? And uh, and so, uh, so I'm not sure if that's an answer or, or not. I'll take no reply as uh, agreement. <laughs> I was going to add, Steve, um, that I think as a clinician, particularly as a physio, you do feel a bit out of your comfort zone. Uh, I know that um, some of the physios that I work with feel really uncomfortable with, you know, asking those questions and what to do if someone does disclose to you that they're suicidal. And, you know, it's quite commonplace, like Tina said, for patients to feel that way when you're in persistent pain. Um, and I think identifying sort of training needs there's um, yeah. various different sort of suicidal training courses um, and I know that Lauren spoke a lot about kind of safety and stabilization skills that you can you can use in, in any profession to try and get your patients um, um, to kind of manage those kind of thoughts so I went on a suicide training course and I definitely found it useful um, and it goes through similar stuff that you speak about, Steve, about identifying protective factors and sort of almost having a kind of a useful uh, plan in place because it doesn't come as naturally coming from a physio profession. It's not something that you, you get in your training when you, you go through physiotherapy to deal with um, mm -hmm. patients that are suicidal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, NHS Highland have delivered in the past a couple of trainings. One of them is called the Assist Training, and the other one's called the Storm Training, which are suicide awareness and kind of action planning, not planning for suicide, but planning for managing people who disclose <laughs> suicidal um, ideation. And like Steve says, it's kind of a calculation, um, calculating risk based on um, risk factors and protective factors, um, as reported to you by the person. Um, and then um, there's sort of, you know, next steps to take based on, you know, the, the information that you gather. But uh, the storm training has been a, a, a quite difficult to access, obviously, over COVID. Um, and also, I think um, uh, the trainers are, are kind of retiring and not necessarily being replaced. Um, but I think that NHS Highland is looking at a, a, a new version of suicide awareness training um, uh, to come on stream. And that'll be part of Statman trainings. Um, uh, depending on your on your profession uh, so that's something that should be coming up soon mm -hmm. certainly most people should have done the storm or assist training as part of their stat man training in the past mm -hmm. yeah it is very prevalent i mean it's a leading cause of uh, death and young men isn't it and it's uh, men of all ages in the hands there with pain but uh with uh and and again that comes back to alistair's uh um discussion about the mind body uh, because uh, you know the emotional pain can be uh, worse or uh, than than physical pain but uh, anyway um, I, I was still recording this this part of the discussion I hope that's all right um, I thought there was some use, really useful questions in there it's really good to hear uh, Chris about your your patient we should end on a high note shouldn't we <laughs> 
<laughs> rather than feeling down. We have to, we still have to organise our, our, our next uh, meeting. Um, I've had a few uh, feedbacks that this time is not all that good for people that, um, uh, that they're finishing work or they're, they're, they're not quite finished or they're travelling home. Um, and so I'm going to have to um, have a, another think about that. And it obviously uh, ties in with our availability as well. Um, but uh, they have, I've managed to put the recording up from the last one about neuropathic pain. And um, I'll post this recording. Uh, and I'll also put up that link to the uh, work of uh, the causes of chronic pain and uh, talking to patients about that in primary care and the maps and the navigator tool and the uh, patient experiences in there. And uh, I'm sorry we didn't have a, a case presentation. I thought the, the discussion was quite interesting and actually Karen um, Labol had kindly volunteered a, a, a case but it's, it's somewhere in my computer and I was sure that I wasn't going to be able to extract it and bring it up on screen. Uh, so maybe do that the next time when we meet in October. But um, I think the seeing as we ran over last time, we could finish early tonight. And uh, unless anybody's got any burning questions, I'll maybe say cheerio to everybody. And thanks very much again for, for everybody coming. Well, that was really good. And thanks so much, Alistair, for presenting that. That was really, really useful. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Have a lovely time. Cheers. Thank you. Okay.